Would you agree that China is using this Hamiltonian approach uh, to economics, uh, perhaps coming from Sun Yat-sen, whose influence uh, of uh, who is highly influenced by Hamilton? Well, China is, it has uh, what I would simply call a, a mixed economy, which means it's uh, partly state directed, partly market directed. I think all successful economies are mixed economies. Uh, and uh, the US, uh, even when it uh, uses uh, free market rhetoric, of course, has a large role of uh, the government not necessarily accurate uh, role, uh, but uh, a large role of uh, government uh, in, in, in the economy. Different uh, countries come down uh, differently on uh, how they uh, carve up the relative uh, weights and responsibilities of public, uh, private, and civil society sectors. It's true that the uh, UK, US, approach is uh, relatively more on uh, the laissez-faire uh, side. I'd say relatively more. We're lower taxes, uh, certainly as a share of national income, a much lower social outlays. Uh, uh, the UK more than the United States, even though it started with laissez-faire in the 19th century, the UK adopted a uh, a national health service, of course, after World War II. The United States never did that. Uh, China's a very pragmatic uh, and uh, uh, economically uh, well-governed country, uh, very impressive uh, during the past 40 years uh, because uh, they've had a uh, planning model uh, with a major role of state finance combined with a, a very dynamic and competitive uh, market sector and a very entrepreneurial uh, uh, lead in uh, many sectors as well. I was just in China uh, and I noted a huge rise of electric vehicles. And there are hundreds of electric vehicle companies right now, startups. Uh, uh, it's uh, expected that the number will whittle down quickly to perhaps uh, between five and 10 such companies, but uh, right now it's named to be in the hundreds of uh, companies producing uh, electric vehicles, and uh, it's a fiercely competitive market uh, inside China. Now, when it comes to the international side, China's just doing a lot of things uh, that the United States did uh, for a while after World War II, which was uh, help finance infrastructure abroad, uh, uh, make the way for U.S. multinational companies, uh, in, in fact. Um, and China right now is doing that. The United States doesn't do much internationally at all other than war, uh, but it doesn't do uh, peaceful economic development activities. And uh, you, you can see in, uh, in uh, the rhetoric of American leaders uh, politicians, uh, their resentment that China dares to help other countries to build infrastructure. You know, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a very valid uh, and uh, quite beneficial win-win uh, program of China, together with more than 150 other countries, by the way, um, is badmouthed every day by the United States, mainly out of resentment uh, and jealousy because the US doesn't have that kind of uh, spirit to make connections uh, with other countries. Uh, and uh, China is making massive uh, investments uh, and working with other countries to help them uh, with developing an electric power grid, uh, basic renewable energy sources, fast rail, 5G uh, technologies, uh, paved roads and highways, and many other desirable things that uh, those uh, counterpart countries really need. Uh, now Biden is talking about uh, a road project from uh, India to uh, uh, the Mideast. And he's so proud of this one road. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It's not financed. It's uh, uh, it, it, it may, may be a good idea, but 
it's a little pathetic actually to to tell you the truth because china has dozens of projects like this all over the world the united states uh, has thought about one uh, <laughs> literally i guess they took the the one belt one road idea but they took one road one. there's <laughs> one corridor that they're talking about uh, whereas china is doing dozens of these projects uh, so the us is kind of looking on I think that so IMEC program, program is dead with the war now in, in uh, Yes, the, I think that's right. And we're so paralyzed, uh, so ineffective, so paralyzed with everything, so war-driven uh, that uh, an idea of a road becomes about the best that we can do and a road that uh, perhaps never will be built. Right. Okay, well, look, I'll come back to China, but... Um, I also uh, knew that you were at the Valdai uh, Discussion Club. Uh, and I I tried to, I was told actually by Richard Sakwa, whom I interviewed yesterday, whom you know, he was also speaking at Valdai, but he told me that you were speaking there on, uh, on the question of the discussion for a new currency and a new international trade mechanism that's taking place within the BRICS. Um, I think you know that uh, Sergei Glazyev, uh, who has been a key economist in this, in formulating these ideas, working with China and the other BRICS countries, and now really the whole global South working on putting together this kind of idea. Um, and you probably know that Lyndon LaRouche, uh, that, that Glazyev has openly praised Lyndon, Lyndon LaRouche's economic ideas and especially the article he wrote in the year 2000, which was called Toward a Basket of Hard Commodities, Trade Without Currency. So um, perhaps you can say a bit about where you think that whole plan stands today. I was not able to find the video of your presentation at Valdai, so um, I'm counting on you to fill us in. Basically, uh, I noted that uh, having uh, one dominant currency in the world, uh, which has been the US dollar uh, after World War II, and which was the pound sterling uh, before uh, World War I, um, has you know, certain advantages uh, because money is uh, just a, a means of uh, uh, settling transactions uh, for the real economy, for the, the non-monetary economy. Uh, so having a, a single currency can be efficient, but the U.S. Uh, has blown it by weaponizing the dollar. Uh, the U.S. Uh, had an advantage because other uh, countries and international businesses uh, use the dollar, and that does give benefits to the U.S., uh, so-called seniorage benefits and other benefits, uh, but essentially the ease uh, of borrowing abroad uh, and very high liquidity of your own national currency. But the U.S. started to weaponize the dollar, meaning uh, rather than letting it be used just for transactions purposes, uh, the United States used this uh, special uh, situation of having transactions pass through the uh, dollar banking system and ultimately through the central bank of the U.S., the Federal Reserve, to start uh, confiscating the dollars of other countries that the U.S. disagreed with in foreign policy. This is really obnoxious behavior, by the way, because <laughs> the idea of uh, money uh, is, uh, again, uh, as a transactions uh, medium, uh, not uh, as a hostage to foreign policy. And uh, because the dollar was so dominant, uh, even after the U.S. confiscated uh, reserves of uh, Iran or North Korea, then Venezuela, now Russia, you know, many countries use the dollar, but they don't like to use it because they're a little afraid of saying a word that's crossed to the U.S. and then seeing the U.S. government come down on them, even freezing their money. It's pretty bad behavior, in my view, uh, but basically very ill-advised because the BRICS countries now, uh, and it started with the original five, uh, with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, but now it's going to include uh, the, the new six, uh, which is Argentina, 
Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and Iran. Uh, this is a big group of countries, and they're saying, we don't want to use the dollar because, frankly, we don't want our money confiscated. Uh, and so uh, they're going to develop uh, an alternative payments system. They will be successful at that because it's not so hard to make payments in other ways, uh, in renminbi or in uh, rubles or in rupees or in an R5 currency, so-called, because the original BRICS-5 all have an R currency, uh, the real, uh, the ruble, uh, the rupee, the renminbi, and the rand. Uh, so uh, they call it the R5, and they may just make a basket uh, using those five currencies uh, for denomination and even for lending and, and borrowing uh, in, in a bond denominated in a basket of currencies. So I expect something interesting and good to come out of this. Uh, again, it's a little bit regrettable in a way if uh, having a single medium of exchange, it, it wouldn't even have to be one country. Uh, Keynes had the idea that it would be uh, the IMF's currency, the Bancor, he called it uh, in a famous uh, writing, um, would have certain convenience. Uh, but if it's then used monopolistically uh, for uh, militarized or foreign policy or geopolitical purposes, it's not going to last long because there are always workarounds when it comes to trade and, and to financial settlements. And that's what the BRICS are doing right now. They're going to do a workaround. I sent you just before we got on this this uh, this uh, call, um, a article that uh, was published by Glaziev, I think just today, or at least recently, on this, in which he emphasizes that while the basket of currencies and the R5, these are definitely uh, being implemented already uh, in various forms, but that eventually the idea of a separate currency, maybe the R5, but some some separate currency, which would be also tied to a basket of commodities uh, rather than just currencies uh, to, in a certain sense, tie it to the cost, the actual cost of production of, of the real economy. Um, and that uh, in that in general, he thinks this is something that can, it, it's basically simple to finish completing it, that he he's hopeful that it can be done by next year when when Russia is head of the uh, of the of the BRICS and will be holding the BRICS conference in in Kazan, I believe. So um, anyway, I'd be interested in your response to his his article. Um, no, I, I, I haven't read it yet. Let me just say that uh, this is there. There are several different issues involved uh, in our discussion. One is uh, the privilege of the U.S. to host the international currency, and I've explained why uh, the U.S. has misused that privilege and why it's uh, now going to uh, lose uh, a lot of the uh, business, so-called, of settlements in dollars. But a, a second is the, the mechanics of payment systems, and the third is the management of monetary policy. These are all distinct issues. Uh, on the payments mechanisms, we can do something that could never have been done before, uh, and that is uh, digital settlements. So we don't even need a banking system now, and uh, we don't need uh, uh, cash in circulation uh, or gold bars uh, and other uh, or gold coins and other mechanisms that were uh, mechanisms of settlement because now uh, digitally uh, every transaction can be tracked. Uh, we know uh, there are different ways to do it. Blockchain is one, but there are many other probably more efficient ways to do it uh, with central bank clearing, for example. And that means that uh, even the, the method of payments, I think, will likely be digital and could well be a central bank digital currency in the future. Then third question is the management of monetary policy. And uh, this is a long debate 
uh, John Maynard Keynes wrote brilliantly about it in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, should uh, a currency, uh, whether digital or uh, physical, um, be convertible into something else, for example, gold or into some commodity basket, or should it be what economists call a fiat currency, which is that it is only backed by the policies of the central bank or, or banks that issue that currency, and its value depends on expectations about those policies. And uh, we've had uh, more than 100 years of debate about that. The advantage of linking a currency to a commodity basket is uh, it can't be issued uh, for uh, political purposes, uh, especially to finance uh, government payments not backed by uh, a flow of uh, tax revenues, for example. So you can't get a hyperinflation uh, in, uh, in a backed uh, currency. And that's been deemed to be the advantage that it uh, is a kind of straitjacket and focuses uh, 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 on the real economy, limits the capacity to issue credit. But on the other hand, it proved to be highly disadvantageous in other circumstances. When the world was on a gold standard or a gold exchange standard, uh, if there were long periods in which major gold deposits were not discovered, that gave, uh, on average, a deflationary uh, uh, weight to the world price trends. And that uh, was deemed to have uh, uh, distributional and real economy effects that were not highly desirable, although it also had some desirable effects as well. It also uh, made it harder for central banks to uh, be lenders of last resort in financial panics. And uh, the Great Depression is a very complicated, fascinating and important subject to understand about central banking and whether the gold standard was uh, a contributor to the persistence of the Great Depression. Well, I don't want us to uh, get into uh, long excursus about uh, monetary theory, except to say that uh, there are several questions on the table right now. First, whose currency? Second, the technology of settlement? And third, the uh, organization of monetary policy. They're all very interesting. I spent uh, many decades studying them. Uh, and uh, I think uh, there's no uh, ideal systems uh, here which is uh, why we continue to have these discussions uh, decade after decade after decade. Right. Well, getting back to China, I did listen to your presentation in Beijing to, at, I think it was at the UN headquarters there, to, uh, I think, probably Group of international ambassadors. ambassadors yeah. yeah. And probably Chinese officials as well, right? But they anyway. Were, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was it was very interesting. I mean, you really focused on the Chinese miracle, the transformation of China over a mere 40 years uh, into, you know, from the one of the poorest to one of the most uh, one of the richest in history, actually, and the transformation of, of elimination of poverty and, and so forth. So, I mean, this was a quite interesting presentation. What I really found interesting was your your discussion of the idea that the Chinese model would be the proper approach for dealing with the development of Africa, uh, which of course is also very much part of China's role in the Belt and Road. Um, but in particular, you contrasted that directly to the policies of the IMF, which I thought I'd ask you to uh, elaborate on here because uh, it was a very interesting way of showing the failure of the IMF to bring about real development in uh, in, Af in Africa or any other part of the developing sector? I think to put it uh, you know, very straightforwardly, uh, the rapid economic uh, growth of China, which was uh, by traditional measures around 10% per year growth of the uh, domestic economy uh, persistently between 1980 and uh, nearly the year 2020, 
So an increase uh, that was more than 30 fold, if you accumulate uh, in the size of the Chinese economy came about by investment. What does investment mean? Investment means building the capital stock of a country. What is a capital stock? A capital stock means the productive assets of an economy. Uh, what are those? Uh, well, those are three main categories. First, what we carry in our own uh, bodies and brains, the so-called human capital. Uh, that's the education and the skills and the health of the population. The second is the physical infrastructure, uh, which is the roads, uh, the power grid, uh, the fiber uh, optics uh, grid, the water and sewerage systems and uh, fast rail highways, uh, all of the uh, networking uh, that uh, the economy uh, depends on. And the third is the business sector, uh, the manufacturing uh, industries, uh, agriculture and so forth. Well, if you look at China's uh, growth during 1980 to 2020, the rates of investment were extraordinary. Uh, the rate of investment means uh, essentially the share of the national income that is uh, invested each year in new capital. And in the United States, uh, the gross investment rate, which means the uh, amount of investment uh, that we undertake, uh, not uh, recognizing that some of it's just offsetting depreciation, the gross investment is uh, something on the order of 15 to 20 percent of uh, the national income. But in China, it was typically 40 to 50 percent of the national income. So a supercharged investment rate. You know, before our eyes, China built thousands of kilometers of fast rail, thousands of kilometers of a highway system, thousands of kilometers of a an electricity distribution system and on and on and on really impressive and that's what powered uh, china that plus the huge investments in uh, education and skills so china started uh, without much infrastructure at all and it started with very uh, poor education levels by the uh, uh, late 1970s because China had had so much turmoil over the preceding 150 years. But then China finally, starting in 1978, said, OK, we're going for it. Uh, Deng Xiaoping came to power. Uh, he was uh, perhaps uh, modern history's single most successful economic reformer. Uh, he pointed China in the right direction, said, go for growth. Uh, open the economy, make a market economy, make a mixed economy, uh, build infrastructure, invest in the people, uh, and uh, lo and behold, that extraordinarily high investment rate uh, led to uh, 40 years of rapid growth. Now, the problem when it comes to the IMF is that the IMF does not have that vision in mind. The IMF's vision to uh, a finance minister of a poor country is don't bother us with your problems. Uh, don't uh, get into excessive debt. Uh, don't uh, get into a financial crisis and uh, don't bother us about your poverty. Thank you very much. Uh, so nobody thinks very hard about uh, the uh, way for these countries to get out of poverty, but the way is it, just like China did, which is uh, massive investments. And then comes the question how to finance those investments. Uh, China partly borrowed in the early years, but also had a massively high saving rate internally. So uh, as the income was rising, China wasn't consuming it in, in uh, a lot of uh, household consumer spending. Uh, Chinese households were saving a lot of their rising income. Chinese businesses were reinvesting a lot of their profits. Uh, the government wasn't running uh, huge deficits uh, uh, on its current transactions and so forth. All of this meant a very high saving rate that could be turned into a high investment rate. Now, Africa right now has a very, very low saving rate because people are impoverished. They can't save more. They have to survive. So they need some help with the financing right now 
by essentially some international financing, uh, say from the African Development Bank or from the Belt and Road Program, in which China can provide some of the financing to build that infrastructure in Africa. But that's the advice that Africa should be getting. Invest, invest strongly, invest heavily, borrow where you need to borrow, uh, get your kids in school, electrify the economy, build the roads, build the fast rail, uh, and so forth. And I think China can help to give some very good advice in that direction. The China model. Right. Yeah, China shows, you know, you can have 40 years of supercharged growth, and that's what Africa needs. 40 years. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> you also spoke at Chufu, the uh, birthplace of Confucius, uh, which now is a, a shrine and a museum, I believe, right? A major site. Well, for... that temple, the Confucian temple, uh, has been there for more than 2,000 years. And each emperor has come and added a stone, you know, added an inscription, added calligraphy, uh, because uh, Confucius has been a, a, an intellectual hero and guidepost for China basically for 2,500 years. So it's really impressive to be there at a Confucius birthday party, which I was, uh, because uh, this, this goes back essentially 2,500 years. And there's, it's a large, uh, large complex of buildings because emperor after emperor added their own building to it. So you really get the, the feel of uh, China's very long, uh, remarkable history. Right, right. And, and you focus there on, on the idea that um, we find our common humanity by studying the great philosophers and thinkers of, of every culture. Uh, in particular, you looked at, at Confucius and Buddha and Aristotle. I, pro I think I would differ with you on Aristotle and would, would have focused on Plato rather than Aristotle. But that's, that's a discussion for another time. Um, but in any case, uh, this idea of looking at the great cultures and the history, the best moments of the great cultures, is the exact opposite of so-called geopolitics, which is what guides the Western leaders today, based deriving from ideologues like Halford Mackinder and, and other ideologues of the British Empire. So, um, which their view is that the only way to advance is by putting down the other guy, the opposite of the interest of the other, and rather, you know, and this of course leads to the sanctions policy. You didn't mention the sanctions when you talked about the theft of reserves, but even the sanctions policy, I, I, as I understand it, is based on the fact that people have to use the dollar in trade, and that therefore they think they have a right to impose these sanctions on countries. But in any case, um, uh, China, of course, is not looking to suppress uh, anybody else <clears throat> and the massive sanctions against China and Russia and many other countries uh, indicates a failure of thinking in terms of the great cultures and what can be done with a culture for the future. So how do we restore that, that, that looking to the great minds of antiquity in the West? I think that there are uh, two philosophical points that we really need to pay attention to that are quite fascinating, quite uh, deep. Uh, one is the question of human nature. Uh, and uh, the uh, philosophers that I referred to, and I, I like uh, Aristotle personally, but also I like the fact that Aristotle, Buddha, and Confucius allow us to talk about the ABCs. Uh, of uh, philosophy. So uh, it's uh, getting back to the, the core ABCs. And what the ABCs, Aristotle, Buddha, and Confucius uh, had in mind about human nature is that it is potentially good, uh, meaning that with proper cultivation, proper education, proper mentoring, uh, living in a decent community, people mm. can learn to be harmonious. People can learn to be fair, trustworthy. Uh, people can learn reciprocity. So this is sometimes called virtue ethics, the idea that people can be decent, you know? 
uh, pretty good. Now, there's another philosophical strain, which is deeply pessimistic. Uh, Augustine in uh, Christian uh, history is the exemplar of that. Man is fallen. Uh, and so uh, man is a sinner. Uh, and there's uh, no way out uh, except perhaps by uh, God's grace. But uh, the sinfulness uh, can't be washed away. And pessimists in history have believed that. And another pessimist uh, like that, that had a huge influence is my second dimension, which is uh, how uh, people behave or how states interact. And Hobbes, uh, in a way, is a follower of Augustine. Uh, Hobbes, of course, uh, wrote in the 1600s, uh, whereas uh, Augustine was uh, more than a millennium earlier than that. But Hobbes was a the quintessential British uh, philosopher who said uh, people are rapacious, they are greedy, uh, they are pushy, they are violent. Uh, and uh, the best you can hope for is that uh, someone controls them from killing each other. So he called for uh, a very uh, tight centralized state for, for that purpose. But basically, the Hobbesian idea is uh, that uh, you can't do anything uh, in a state of nature but defend yourself from being killed by someone else. And strangely enough, while uh, British thinkers accepted that there would be a national government that would stop people from killing each other inside Britain, uh, they took the view that internationally, it is a Hobbesian war of all against all, that just countries fight with each other. And this is uh, in the uh, current uh, thinking of international relations uh, known as the, uh, the realist school. And uh, our leading realist thinker in the United States is uh, John Mearsheimer uh, at University of Chicago. He's, he's a wonderful person and a tremendous gentleman and a great scholar. But he thinks that countries are, and especially great powers, are inevitably uh, at each other's throats. And unfortunately, there's a lot of empirical evidence uh, that uh, this is often the case. But uh, John Mearsheimer says the implication of this is that the world is tragic. His, his most famous book is called The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, because he says conflict is just about inevitable between major powers because nobody trusts each other. Uh, you can't trust each other. It's a war of all against all. Uh, it's uh, eat or be eaten, kill or, kill or be killed. And so, yes, life's tragic. And I uh, debate him. Uh, again, we're friends and I admire him a lot. I want to be clear. But I say, John, we can't accept tragedy as our fate. We have to do better than that. And so I go back to the philosophers and the philosophers taught, you know, you can have harmony. That was Confucius's main message, which is it's possible actually to be decent. It's possible to observe what uh, was famous for uh, Confucius and in similar terms for us in uh, the Western culture as the golden rule. Do not do to others what you would not have them do to you. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're a Hobbesian, you say, oh, uh, there goes Sachs moralizing, but that's not how the world is. Uh, you know, I'm going to do what I can to the others because otherwise they're going to do something terrible to me and I'm going to get there first. And because I say that, no. Because that's human nature. That's what they are. Be because that's the deep human nature. That's inevitable. Yeah, right. But I don't believe it. It's certainly not the case that we're always at war against each other. We are can be better than that. But by the way, China absolutely has a different history and a different mindset. And this is also a fascinating point. It's not just Confucius versus Hobbes. It's actually history. 2000 years of statecraft. What have we learned? Well, in China, for most of the 2000 years, there was a centralized state. This is very important. For most of the 2000 years, 
there was the Han dynasty or the Tang dynasty or the Song dynasty or the Yuan dynasty or the Ming dynasty or the Qing dynasty or today the People's Republic of China. And for most of that 2000 years, there was one country. And while there were rebellions and there were a lot of invasions from the north, mainly from the nomadic peoples in the dryland, grassland, steppe regions, there was one country, big, big population. Now in Europe, after 476 AD, when the Roman Empire fell in the West, there never again was one dominant power of Western Europe. So there was war nonstop. Think of Britain and France, for example. How many years were they at war during the past thousand years? An incredible amount across the channel. Now compare that with China and Japan. How many years were China and Japan at war between, uh, well, you could take it back before 1000 AD, but say from 1000 AD to uh, 1890. The answer is two years. I think it's 1274 and 1281, if I remember correctly. Uh, and there was actually one incursion a third year. Uh, now, two of those were when the Mongols ruled China and they tried to invade Japan and failed on two occasions. Once was when a shogun, a military commander of, uh, of J Japan, ridiculously tried to, tried to invade uh, China and was terribly defeated uh, in, in the Korean Peninsula. But my point is, it's not that. My point is they didn't fight for a thousand years, barely a skirmish. By the way, when Japan industrialized and was the first industrializing nation, Japan followed the realist approach, sadly. Japan said, okay, now we're part of the imperial club. Now we're gonna go invade China. And the Chinese diplomat said, what are you doing? We're Asians. And Japan said, no, 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 now we're part of the Western club. <laughs> this was back in the 1890s. Uh, so Japan really behaved badly by becoming an imperialist power for some period. But China never did in that way. And if we understand the different philosophical roots, uh, this is crucial. Uh, if we understand the different experience of Europe and China, we can come to appreciate that our mindset in the West that, well, it's war all the time, so China's an enemy, so we better go at it, is nothing the way that China thinks. And when I said to John Mearsheimer again, I want to stress a friend and, a, you know, a, and a brilliant scholar, when, when I said all this warmongering against China, is going to create a self-fulfilling prophecy of war. He said, yes. I said, John, self-fulfilling. We don't need to have that war. He said, yes, but that's how it is. And yeah. I said, no, we don't need to have it that way. We can do better than that. So that's, that's the debate. Helga uh, issued what she calls the 10 principles of for an architecture of security and development for the world as a whole. And most of them are sort of self-evident. You need education, you need uh, cultural training, you need uh, health, so forth. But the 10th principle is exactly what you just brought up, that the nature of man is good. And this is the one that's most difficult for people to accept or understand but it's the fundamental one. It's really the issue as, as I think you correctly just located. This is what distinguishes the idea of being committed to global development rather than global war. Um, and of course, as you said also, the Confucian concept of harmony and the concentration on, on education is really the center of the Chinese development of their own country uh, over the last 40 years. and what's now being taken out to the rest of the world through the Belt and Road. And uh, as as you know, you, we just had the Belt and Road, third, third Belt and Road Forum in Beijing with 150 countries uh, represented. 
um, which certainly demonstrates that they've failed miserably in the isolation of, uh, of China in the world, you know, uh, and uh, that the idea that they could get countries to decouple from China has <laughs> has just forced most countries to say, you're crazy. Uh, this is where development is rather than war and sanctions. Um, and in fact, the headline of our EIR this week is going to be on the fact that Xi Jinping offered a $100 billion new investments through the Belt and Road at the same time that uh, Mr. Biden was offering a $100 billion investment in wars, naming specifically uh, Russia, meaning Ukraine, uh, Israel, the genocide being carried out against, against the Palestinians, uh, and, and China. They included Taiwan as one of the places where this $100 billion so it's pretty clear that they're talking about a global war. Um, and the only question is, how can this madness be stopped and reversed? Well, it, it is uh, so unacceptable American foreign policy. And what I hope uh, people are coming to understand is that the arrogance and the militarization of the United States uh, that has been demonstrated uh, time and again now over the past 30 years is not bringing security to the US. Uh, it has busted the budget. Uh, we've uh, spent trillions of dollars on these uh, horrible wars uh, that have accomplished nothing except violence and destruction and rising debt. And they're not making America safer at all. Uh, there are more and more wars that are a reflection of this arrogance because the arrogance has meant that America, American policymakers have thought we can do what we want and we don't have to talk with anybody about it. We don't need diplomacy. We just need uh, our military and the military can't solve political problems. And uh, we're finding out again and again that the military approach uh, doesn't, uh, it doesn't work to solve uh, the deeper problems uh, of uh, humanity and uh, can't settle political issues. For that, you need politics. You need diplomacy. Uh, and I mean politics in the positive sense of, uh, of, of uh, uh, getting together to uh, work out arrangements for people to live peacefully together. So I think the failures of American foreign policy are on full display. Um, also, the ignorance of it, because I would cite uh, our national security advisor statement, Jake Sullivan, uh, about a week before the violence uh, blew up in uh, uh, Israel and, and uh, Gaza with the Hamas uh, attack and now the bombing of uh, Gaza, Jake Sullivan said, the Middle East is the quietest that it's been in two decades. Uh, and it shows uh, they don't know anything except what their own imagination is and they don't understand what's happening around the world what's happening around the world is that people want a different approach they want development uh, they want social justice they, they want uh, the chance for decent lives they don't want the militarized approach mike we're gonna have to go i uh, uh great to speak with you and uh, i have a call uh, starting right now